Hey, hey, this is Teresa Matsura, and you're listening to Uncanny Japan. Last episode was part one of the Okami, the Japanese wolf. It was all the basics the two kinds of wolf, Honshu and Hokkaido, what they looked like, what they did, and how they became extinct in 1905. I even talked about a local wolf temple slash shrine that I visited. Which, by the way, if you're a patron and you haven't seen it, I put up a bunch of photos and information over on the Uncanny Japan Patreon site. I've decided I'm going to be doing more of those kind of posts. I'll visit some interesting and obscure temple or shrine, take a bunch of photos, hopefully some video, do a bit of research, and share it all over there. I already have the next trip planned. It's going to be a Kitsune shrine, but it's not Fushimi in Kyoto. This is a different one. And I also found a couple of really cool Buddha statues near that one. So pictures and information about that little day jaunt will go up on Patreon in November. Today, though, it's Wolf Part 2. Let's get more into the myth and lore of these beautiful beasts. Would you like to explore the stranger, more obscure corners of Japanese culture? Dig a little deeper into superstitions, curious customs, and all those mysterious creatures that inhabit the land? If so, then this is the podcast for you. Uncanny Japan is where I, author Teresa Matsura, share all the fascinating tidbits I unearth while doing research for my writing. From the bizarre to the ghastly, and everything in between. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome back. Remember in last episode when I said the wolf could be called an Okami, or a Yama Inu, mountain dog, or even Oinu-sama, which is a very, very polite way of just saying dog. Let me start today's episode with an old saying that gives you an idea of the reverence held for these canines. It goes, Inuyama damare, kumayama sawage. When on a wolf mountain, be quiet. When on a bear mountain, be loud. Bears, it goes, are for the most part timid and can be startled away by noise. Even today, people carry bear bells and jangly things on their walking sticks when hiking in the mountains to alert the animals that someone is coming and to shoo them off. I think it's common knowledge that the worst thing you can do is come upon a bear and surprise it. That's when they attack. So, on a bear mountain, be loud. Let them know you're coming. Kumayama Sawage. But wolves own their mountain, Inuyama Damare. On a dog mountain, shut up. You wouldn't go onto a wolf mountain making a lot of noise. You'd be respectful and you'd keep it down. I think one big takeaway I got from reading about Okami in Japan is that while in Western lore wolves are big and bad and eat up grannies and dress up like sheep and whatnot, in Japan, they were seen as either messengers of the gods or gods themselves. To be feared, for sure, but also to be respected and worshipped. I read a lot about something called Okami Shinko, which means wolf worship. So even though wolves in Japan have been extinct for over a hundred years, there are still shrines dedicated to them all over Japan. Rare, though. You kind of have to search for them. I read there is something like only 20 on Honshu, although I'd bet there are more tucked away that haven't been counted. Anyway, some temples or shrines still remain, and when you go to them, you'll find people visiting and paying respects to the wolf as protector, guardian, keeping one safe from fires, and aiding in both fertility and easy childbirth. 
to name a few of its attributes. Of all the wolf shrines, there were two that I kept seeing, mentioned over and over again, and it took forever to figure out how they differed. Both devoted to the wolf, and with similar names. Sometimes the myth around them was the same, too. Then you have another wolf shrine in Tokyo with the same name as one of them, and it all got quite confusing for a while. But I think I figured it out. So let's keep it simple. One is Mitsumine Shrine, located in Chichibu in Saitama Prefecture. It's said to have been founded around 2,000 years ago and is associated with the Emperor Keiko. And then there is Mitake Shrine, also in Chichibu, Saitama, on Mount Mitake, no less. That one is associated with Emperor Sujin and founded before the Mitsumine Shrine. However, there is a Mitake Shrine located in Shibuya that is also dedicated to the wolf. That one was founded in the late 1600s. I don't know, it's still a little confusing. But let me tell you the myth around the Mitsumine Shrine. The story goes something like this. Prince Yamato Takeru, the legendary unifier of Japan and the son of the 12th emperor, was traveling on a military expedition when an evil spirit in the form of a deer appeared along with a thick mist. It then sneakily led Prince Yamato Takeru and his group astray. Before they knew it, the prince and his men were very lost and deep in the mountains. It was bad. The deer then up and vanished, and now they were really lost. So lost, in fact, that they had to stop moving altogether, not knowing which way to go or what to do. Then, just when all was its bleakest, along comes a white wolf, a god in disguise, to guide them out of the mountains. Yamato Takeru was so grateful and moved by this divine animal that he told it to remain there, fight off evil, and become the Oguchi no Makami, the true god with the big mouth. As for the Mitake Shrine, the other one, also called Musashi Mitake, the one located in the mountains of Chichibu Tamakai National Park, not Shibuya, here is one of the few places that still practice, once a year, an ancient form of divination called futomani. This is a Shinto practice thought to predate even tortoise shell divination, which came from China. Futomani most likely started back in the Jomon era, think 5000 to 500 BCE. Futomani is performed by heating the shoulder blade bone of a stag, take that deer, and interpreting the cracks that appear. People also visit this shrine if they are possessed by some evil and need to be exorcised which totally jives with my friend's story that I talked about last episode and his daughter and asking the wolf for help. Different shrine, same wolf deity. Now let's talk about Okuri Inu, literally sending or escorting dog. Okuri Inu was a kind of yokai that frequented tales from the Tohoku region all the way down to Kyushu. It was sometimes a dog, but sometimes a wolf. Remember how those terms become interchangeable at times. So what does this mysterious Okuri Inu do? Basically, it watches over travelers in the mountains. Sometimes it protects or guides them. Sometimes, if you are just too exhausted to go on and collapse, it will eat you up. If you're tired from your journey, though, and you just sit down to rest... Like you don't completely give up, but you just kind of sit there. It will leave you alone. I don't know a lot about wolves, but wouldn't that just be a hungry wolf's nature? And not so much a yokai? I don't know. So I imagine old-fashioned folk hiking through the mountain paths late at night on their way home, and they look up to see a wolf watching, silently following they continued on with the Okami, always close by, but not attacking, just observing. 
And I guess once these travelers made it home safe and sound, they remembered the wolf and imagined that it was making sure they made it home okay. The dog was escorting them home. I mean, it's not like the wolf was secretly waiting for the traveler to slip and hit his head on a rock or anything so they could have a late night meal. No. It said that if you make it to your destination, then you should turn to say goodbye and thank you to the old Kami for guiding you back home safely. It'll then turn and disappear back into the forest. Another belief says you should first wash your feet, then give thanks for the safe journey home. Then, offer the okurinu some kind of gift, food, or a single tabi sandal. Only after that will leave. Again, knowing dogs the way I do, offering it an old shoe just begs the image of a regal wolf bringing it back to its den to present it to its pups to play with. I mean, I just made that up. I have no idea why one straw sandal was offered to the wolf, but it was. There was an author named Koyama Masao who wrote a collection of folk stories that was published during the Showa era, and in it there are tales about the escorting dog. One of the stories was about a very pregnant woman who was returning to her parents' home, as is custom even now, to give birth to her child and get some help and care from her mother. Unfortunately, on the way home, while in the hills, she went into labor. Night fell, and she delivered the baby right there on the mountain path. Afterward, many wolves gathered around. The distraught woman cried out, If you're going to eat us, then just eat us. But instead, they spent the night protecting the mother and the child from other bad things that lived in the forest. She was able to make it to her parents' house the next day. Later, after hearing this story, her husband went to thank the Okurinu and give them some sekihan, a kind of red beans and mochi rice, which is usually served on auspicious occasions. There are quite a few Okuri Okami legends that are basically the same. Wolves that will gobble you up if you collapse in the mountains. But if you are kind and respectful, they'll watch out for you and make sure you get home okay. Some folk beliefs say that while the Okuri Inu protect people, there is also a Mukai Inu. This was translated as welcoming dog, but Mukai has the meaning of going and meeting somebody or going and getting somebody. So the Mukai Inu are the bad ones that will attack you and eat you. An aside is that there is also something called an Okuri Itachi, an escorting weasel, who it said is a friend of the Okuri Inu. And there's something called an Okuri Suzume, a sending off or escorting sparrow. This little one follows you and chirps to make sure you are safe. I didn't read anything about it ripping you from limb to limb if you happen to collapse on your way home, although it is rumored that the tiny bird is actually a wolf in disguise. Speaking of disguise, if you think about it, Japanese foxes, kitsune, and tanuki are always transforming into one thing or person or another to trick humans. But except for that little bit about the sparrow, wolves remain true to themselves. They show you exactly who they are. They can hide, and they do, but not because they want to trick you. It's just because they don't want to be seen. Kunio Yanagita famously wrote that a wolf can hide even where there is only a single reed. Some other wolf tales. There is one about wolves raising a baby that had been left in the forest. Later, that baby grew up to become the leader Fujiwara no Hidehara. Wolves are said to have howled before a flood in 1889, thus warning the villagers in the Tamaki Mountains of the danger. They even got a tree named after him for this act of kindness. It's called the Cypress of the Dog Howls. Another story is sometimes if a family member did not return from a journey, a wolf would appear at your door and howl sadly, letting you know that they had died. A couple more wolf things and then I'll let you go. 
One is that there are still people out there hoping against hope that wolves haven't gone extinct and are just deep in the mountains staying away from us pesky humans. A man named Hiroshi Yagi has spent literal decades devoted to this cause. He's reportedly seen and heard the Yama Inu or Ookami, even taken a photo of one in 1996, although some dispute whether or not it's just a wild dog or a real wolf. He has a blog that he updates with results from his trail cams, as well as information other wolf enthusiasts send him from all over Japan. Recordings of howls, descriptions of possible sightings, and photos of scat. Hiroshi Yagi is in his 70s now, and wouldn't it be wonderful if his dream would come true and he'd find real evidence that the wolf were still alive? Another wonderful thing I found while researching was a Japanese band called Seppuku Pistols. Their logo is an image of a wolf, and they say of themselves, they are the last survivors of the Japanese wolf. They are so cool. Think a mix of punk with traditional Japanese taiko, shamisen, and shakuhachi thrown in. I think some call it post-electricity punk or Edo-era punk but that's not how they define themselves. I'm quite crazy about them, but I kind of got a nationalistic vibe, which made me a little nervous. But I've since read that they say they aren't nationalistic, but instead they just want us all to get along by merging left and right and destroying all the flags. They really are fun, thrilling, loud, raucous. So if you want to check them out, go to YouTube. Seppuku pistols, and sometimes they howl before songs. I'll stop for now. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for supporting the show. I will talk to you again real soon. Boink. Boink. You've reached the end of the show, and I just want you to know how much we appreciate you listening and supporting us. Any subscribing, reviewing, and gushing to your friends, family, even random strangers, really does help keep us going. If you have the means and you want to help a little more and get a little more, we are making extra content over on Patreon. All for only $5 a month. Or, if you like to read horror, you might be interested in my Bram Stoker-nominated short story collection, the Carp-Faced Boy and Other Tales. Hontoni arigato gozaimasu. Thank you again, and I'll talk to you real soon.